Hello friends, in today's episode in Know Your Roots, we will be exploring the cultural connect between the IVC and uh, Tamil civilization. In the IVC regions on a macro level involving the planning of all the major cities starting from Mohanjadaro to the uh, Sokratoda which was excavated in Gujarat in 1972 where the western part of a city or a town is always located at an elevation and the eastern part is on the lower side. But what is the reason behind this? Rita Wright, the anthropologist at New York University, gave her own observation saying that the architects were trying to recreate and mimic nature settings while designing the town. Kirtar mountain range is an independent mountain range in Pakistan running through the Sindh and Balochistan province that stands at a height of 1260 meters above mean sea level towards the west and slopes down towards the east. Now, Mohanjadaro is a little towards the east at an elevation of about 60 meters and there, as in all the other uh, city planning happening in the IVC region, which is dichotomous with a citadel on one end at a height which housed the probably administrative quarters, then a common ground in the middle which housed the granaries, the great bath, the collegiums and even uninhabited zones. And then the lower part, the eastern side that was inhabited by the common folk, the artisans and whatnot. Now this they have been able to uh, support with archaeological evidence. And Rita Wright claims that this is following the slope of the Kirtar mountain. So what did they do in the Mohanjadaro city to put up the citadel? They created a mound 18 meters high. Now, Taking into consideration that the height of a standard room in our home is about 3 meters, this is a 6 story height that they would have achieved by packing about 4 million cubic meters of clay and sediment together with millions of bricks. And they achieved this grandeur scale to house the citadel. And this is a pattern followed again and again. Now, here is where this gets interesting. The high west and the low east has a direct linguistic correlate in Tamil, which is very hard to miss. We know that in Tamil, west is Merke and east is Kiriakke, which also is denoted by Mela and Kiriak. Now, in, if you take in Madurai, we have Mela Masi Vidi and Kira Masi Vidi. We know it is west and east. And uh, if you take it a little further, this is also used in this connotation in various regions like for example take the Kaveri river belt. The farmers who live along the river which actually follows a northwest southeast gradient know about these terms such as male varambu, kir varambu, male neer, kir neer and male pasanam, kir pasanam where in the social hierarchy the upper regions or the western part were always belonging to the landlords while the tillers lived in the Kirvarambu or Kirmadai so that when the river went into floods which in those days happened quite often and in fact caused a lot of misery to people living along its uh, regions and was one of the reasons why the great Karigala Chola built the Grand Anaikat about which we'll be seeing in detail later the tillers were the ones affected by the floods and the landlords were safe. And by taking this into the place name connotation, again, Mr. Balakrishnan in his journey of a civilization has recorded how there are 800 place names in the Tamil region of today with either male or kir as a prefix. And there are 333 dichotomous pairs of place names like for example, again in Madurai, you have Kirakuilkudi and Melakuilkudi. And 70% of the time, they follow the same west-east pattern, meaning Melakuilkudi will be on the west, Kirakuilkudi on the east. So this connection is very hard to miss. And one of the stones that was found in a place called Arasalaburam, belonging to the 5th century AD, carries an inscription Mercheri, where there is also a Kircheri, 
And why is this particular inscription very interesting? Is it is because it has the engraving of a uh, fighting cock in it. Now, this was a hero stone in commemoration of a fighting cock belonging to the Mercheri that must have won a fight. There is a similar seal in the Indus Valley that clearly captures cockfighting as a sport. And today, in the Sindh province of Pakistan, competitive cockfighting still goes on. And it is very interesting to note that cockfighting has always been associated only in regions that had Dravidian language speaking people in the Indian subcontinent. And all of us know that even today, though it is banned by the government as cruelty to the animal, cockfighting happens clandestinely in villages. And in our resort that is known as Kadambavanam Temple of Tamil Traditions, every year during the Pongal festivity, we invite the villagers to come with their fighting cocks and give us a small demo just for the guests to experience a part of our culture. Now, this said and done, there is another seal, seal number 338 in the Indus Valley, which I'm showing you now, which has an image of two cocks side by side. And this was interpreted as cock city. And Airavada Mahadevan correlated this to Koryur, which was the name of the capital of the early Cholas, which we know by Urayur. And in this continuation, another sport that is a part of the Tamil psyche is the Jallikattu. The Zebu bull is an oft-repeated animal in the Indus seals and in all its majesticity resembles our Kangeyam Kale. And there is one particular seal that I'm showing you here, where it shows the bull throwing a half a dozen uh, youth into the air and they are lying around. And it is very clear that the bull has had a go at them. So what does this seal speak of? If only we were able to read the Indus script, we would know that it was definitely some sort of Yer Taruvidal, the traditional name, which is oft repeated in Sangam literature and these are some verses from the Kalitohe capturing the significance of Yeru Thaluvadal. Kolletu kodu anjuvane marumayum kullale aya mahal. And the girl in a particular home got to choose whom she wanted to marry. How? By letting her prospective grooms fight for her hand by overcoming or taming her bull. And this was a practice very, very popular, but it didn't make for a very pretty scene either. It was rather a very harsh sport, as can be recalled by these few lines. Sudar virindanna suri netrikkari vidariyam kanni poduvane saadi kudar suriya kutti kulaippadan totram kaan padarani andi pasungan kadavul idariya yetri yerume nenjidandittu this is Sangat Tamil. Here, Sudar Virindanna Surinetrikari. There is this ferocious black color bull that has a spreading mark on its head and it charges against the man coming towards it, puts him to the ground and gores open his stomach and has pulled out all the intestines. And the heroine's friend says, Look at this. What does it remind you of? at the time of the end, when the Kutruvan comes, that is the Lord of Death, it's as if he has pulled out these intestines to feed to the gauls and the spirits. So why did they need these sort of practices, one would question, because of the kind of harsh lives that they led. Let's not forget the other Sangam poem, which is very popular, where a lady of the house was approached by a tiger in her backyard and she uses the muram or the sulavir to shoo it away. So if she were so brave, then obviously she would have wanted a brave husband as well. This was the kind of life that was captured in Sangam literature. And look at this next scene where you have a man fighting with two tigers. This was the kind of bravery with which they had to live in those wild regions. And now look at a similar scene 
that has been found close to Karur in a place called Manjanaikan Patti. The similarity between the Indus seal and this tiger seal is very hard to miss, on top of which it reminds us of the Chola emblem, the tiger. And of course, we know that the fish symbol that we saw in previous episodes, the fish was the royal emblem of the Pandya kings who ruled from the Madurai regions. Now, starting from this point, there are references to several animals in the Sangam literature that have absolutely no place in Tamil regions but have nevertheless been described in such realistic terms in Sangam poetry. Let's take a very interesting example of the camel which as we know is the ship of the desert and is not at all native to Tamil country. The camel has been described in two beautiful contexts in Sribanatra Padai. In one verse, Vong nilai ottaham tuil madindanna veeng tirai konarnda virai mara virahin. Virai mara virahu, the driftwood of the aromatic ahil tree is washed ashore by the mighty ocean waves and the pile of wood appears to look like a large camel sleeping on the desert sand. Now, where in, in the Tamil country could a poet have observed this scene to actually sing these verses? Now, take an even more interesting song. Kurumborei unangum tadar vel yenbu kadungal vottahat algu pasitirkum kalnedung kavalaya kanam nindi. The there is a desert region here in the description, very severe drought and absolutely no food. And in such conditions, it is shown that a camel is pushed to eating bones. Now, where would again a poet have seen a bone eating camel in the context of the Tamil regions? The Ram of Kutch in Gujarat is given as a backdrop for these scenes or rather suggested as an ideal backdrop for these scenes by Mr. Balakrishnan and David Shulman, the author of the very interesting a biography of Tamil, says how these memories should have been carried forward by poets who actually lived in the regions through oral transmission for generations till they were recorded here in the Tamil country in around the Sangam period. Now, let's go to another interesting description, this time in the context of the Pali region again involving the wild ass. We all know that the donkey is a beast of burden, but the wild ass again, which is known as the Kove Rikkarade and which is often found in the Sangam literature described by the term Atiri, is not native to Tamil Nadu. And Parpola, the Finnish Indologist whom we saw in the previous episode, has even given the etymology of the word karudai to mean kali and udai, where by kali he means the upangari, the harsh salt pans, and udai meaning the ass that kicks. And probably the people who then migrated into Tamil regions saw the domestic donkeys that we have today, and since it appeared similar to the wild ass, named it the karudai. This is the uh, point of view that he, he gives. And then now let's go to the song itself. This is a scene in the Nadal regions, the coastal plains, in Ahana Nuru, sung by Ulochanar. Kalicheru Adiya Kanekal Attiri Kulambinum Seira Odina. Walking in the marshy, dry salt pans and always being wet, the hooves of this wild ass is full of open wounds and sores. And the gashes are so deep that Seira, meaning the red shrimp in the oceans, go and lodge themselves in the hooves. And the donkey is walking with pain. What a realistic description. And here is yet another song involving the Atiri. Kalichura irinda puntal Atiri nedu neer irungali pari melindu asiyi. Kalichura irinda puntad. The hooves of the wild ass have been bitten by sharks, and on top of which it has been walking through this marshy land, limping, 
and hence has become very tired and is hence going very slowly. Now, when we think of salt pans, we can only think of Tutukudi and there, there are no vast stretches of desert lands with white marshy soil, neither there are any sharks. But the Ran of Kutch region in Gujarat up to Dholavira is a perfect backdrop for this with when the uh, water evaporates, leaving behind these vast stretches of marshy lands, which is in fact a tourist attraction today, on top of which the Gujarat coast is known to be a breeding ground for a very rare breed of whale shark. So this forms very interesting food for thought where the very setting of the Sangam literature could be shifted to the IVC pathways. Another animal of interest here mentioned in the Tirukkural, Mayir Nipin Vara Kavarima Annar Veer Nipar Manam Varin. If one loses one's honor in society, one might as well lose one's life. Like what? The simile used here is the Kavari Ma losing its hair. Now, Parime Larahar, whose authoritative commentary to the Tirukkural clearly mentions Kavari Ma as a Himalayan yak, whereas commentators who came later made the Kavari Ma into Kavari Man, associating it with a deer, which is actually wrong. And one of the um, characteristics or traits of the Himalayan yak is to lose its hair and when it loses its hair it will obviously die because of the cold climate. Now Kavarima is repeated in various contexts in Tamil Sangam literary works and especially in one poem it is shown eating the Narande grass which is again not found in Tamil country against the backdrop of the Himalayas drinking cool water from wide waterfalls, on top of which the bushy long tail of the Himalayan yak is known as the Kavuri and this was used as a fly fat for um, kings of Easter years and later on the same fly flap today is used in temples and it is from the word Kavuri meaning the bushy tail of the Kavari Ma that you get Savari, the, the long false hair that women attach and all of us know that right. So these kind of interlinkings between our culture, our living culture and the IVC are too interesting to ignore. Another animal often used in the Sangam literature to denote strength and courage and royalty but is not at all native to these regions is the lion. The Asiatic lion also known as the Indian lion the population remaining which is found in small pockets only in Gujarat, earlier was found in Sindh and Balochistan, spreading up to the east, that is Bengal, and up to the south, that is up to river Narmada. But never was the lion found south of the Narmada river. Now, that being the case, there are many poems in Sangam literature that vividly describe the mountain lion roaming around in the nights and how other animals shiver by merely listening to its roaring sound. And here is an interesting line. Vandu padattadainda kanni onkalal uruvak kudirai malavar otiya murugan narpor neduvel avi aruvottu yane podini angan neduvel avi the hero, the chieftain belonging to the Avir clan and belonging to the Podini Hills. And we saw in an earlier episode how this Podini Hills was associated with Parani, but uh, the other climatic conditions quite not fitting the description. Here again, this song in Ahana Nuru of Mamulanar talks of Aruhotu Yane, where the elephant is chasing the lion. There are also songs that show the lion chasing the elephant, all of which could not have happened in the Tamil country at all. A very interesting Noorpa from the Tolgapiyam Purladiharam reads as follows Selvam Pulane Punarva Vilaya Tendra Allal Nita Uvahai Nange. What are the four things that give people happiness? Wealth, the five sensory pleasures sex and games. 
how observant has Tolhavir been and what is the sort of importance that has been given to playing games. In Sangam poems, there are several instances talking about girls and boys, men and women playing games. Vilayadu ayamodu orai aadadu ilayor illidatthu irchar in the irutthal aranum andre aakamum theima meaning one has to play and if one doesn't play it is almost bordering on aranum andre unethical and one will lose one's efficiency as well. Now when sociologists look at the great bath right in the center of Mohanjadaro they they feel that it is a marker of an important social context where people came together and played in the water, men and women together, where there are several references in Nedinalvade of such happenings in our own Vaihe River. And moving on to games, one of the important finds in almost all the IVC cities are the dice, the humble dice made of terracotta. And what makes it interesting is not that similar dyes have been found in Kiradi and Adichanalur, but that we are using this and playing board games like this even today. All of us have grew up playing these board games and in Sangam poems there are references of adults having dice matches and having a permanent place marked out in the villages where they could come and sit and play these games. Now look at this picture of men sitting and playing. This is from a village that is very close to our Kadambavanam known as Podugambatti. And this shows that the practice continues till date. Similarly, even today our boys play with marbles and of course they are quite smooth because they are mostly made of glass. But Harappan excavations have also thrown up marbles made of precious materials like jasper and agate of such fine finish Another interesting cultural connect, of course, is jewellery. Many of the precious and semi-precious stones that were used, carnelian beads and agate and jasper, are still worn by us. But if there were one particular medium used for making bangles that finds a place quite often in Sangam literature, that is the humble conch shell. And Bel Valai, the white colored bangles made out from the conch shells, were very, very popular in the imagination of Sangam poems. And shell cutting is known to have been one of the major commercial activities of the IVC regions. Shell bangle factories have been excavated at Lothal and Goladora, and a few sites in Maharashtra and Gujarat, as you can see here in the slide. And archaeological evidence of such ancient shell bangle factories have been found in Tamil Nadu at Porundal, Kodumanal and K. Rajan, has, the noted archaeologist, has noted that the shell bangles have been made with the same technique that was used in the IVC region. While searching for the antiquity of our own roots, the earliest civilization in the Indian subcontinent is the Indus civilization and if we were to establish its Dravidian antiquity, we are establishing the antiquity of Tamil civilization. So till we meet again, Manakam.